Hello, welcome to the Maya Tool Belt. This is Michael. In this video, we're going to continue looking at Hypershade Utilities. A uh, thing I like to do when I'm using the Hypershade rather extensively is to replace my perspective camera with the Hypershade. To do that, we're going to go to the Panels menu, Panel, Hypershade. And once I've done that, my panel becomes the Hypershade itself. Now, I do have the channel box over here still on. I'm going to click that little tab here to collapse that down. So now we have strictly the Hypershade filling our view. So the next utility I wanted to talk about is one that's kind of complicated, but not, I don't know, once you really look at it though, it's not too bad. Let's look at the condition utility. Here under utilities, we can find condition. If I left click on it, you can see this. So we have lots of stuff in here. You'll notice we have a first term, a second term, an operation, then color if true and color if false. So what, are, what does all this mean? First of all, let's zoom in here and look at our node. So here are our inputs. We have four inputs. Two of them are vector inputs or XYZ RGB values. And the second two here, first term and second term, are floating values. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, please feel free to look at the Hypershade data type video I did to kind of explain these terms. If you click on the little I, in the upper right corner, you can see a link to that video. So these are the inputs, two vectors and two floats. And the output here is a color, a vector color, RGB. So what are we trying to do here? Well, there's lots of really interesting ways that you can use this utility. I'm going to try to show you a couple examples. Now, because I want to show you something that's happening in the viewport while I have the Hypershade open, I'm actually going to add a viewport to the Hypershade. Now, because I am using the Hypershade as a panel, it actually doesn't really like me to do that. If I go to Windows, Viewport right now, nothing happens. So I can press the spacebar to go back to my perspective camera here. And I'm going to go to Windows, Rendering Editors, Hypershade, to actually open the Hypershade as a separate window like this. So now that I've done this separately, I can go to Window, Viewport, and a viewport opens. I can then drag this viewport into my UI like this and add the viewport in. I can then close the Hypershade and go back to Panels, Panel, Hypershade, reactivate this as my Hypershade and there is my viewport now. So using the Hypershade as your panel uh, does have that little drawback, but there is a workaround doing that method. So now I have a viewport here, I have a little window right here into my scene built inside of my Hypershade. So I can start to use this. So, so looking at the condition utility, we have here a first term and a second term, two values, and then an operation. The operation will compare these two values and ask a question. If we click on the pull down menu, we have all these different uh, operations we can choose from. Equal, they're not equal, greater than, greater or equal, less than, less or equal, these things here are comparing our two values together in different ways. So let's just keep it at equal for now. So with equal, the operation is asking, is the first term equal to the second term? Is that true or false? If it is true, then it looks to the true result, color if true. This result then is what is used. If the operation looks at the two terms and asks, are these two terms equal? and the answer is false, then the color if false vector value is used instead of the true one. So that's hopefully makes a little bit of sense of what how this works. Now, how is this useful? That's the big question. Like, what do we do with this? So there's lots of ways to, to use this and it's hard to really explain it in a really good way, but let, let me just explain it in a little bit, bit of a visual way. So I'm gonna create a plane, I'm gonna go create polygon primitives, plane like this. Press the 5 key here to see it. And then I'm going to hide the grid and create a sphere. So create polygon primitives sphere. Okay, I'm going to apply a material to my sphere. So I'm going to right click and say assign a, a new material. We'll just use a Lambert. We'll zoom out a little bit here. So we have our condition here, and then Lambert. 
So what are we going to ask? Let's say we have the sphere. If it is above the plane, it's one color. If it's below the plane, it's a different color. So we're looking at the translate y value of the sphere. Okay. So looking at our condition here, our first term is going to be the y value of the sphere. That's the, the uh, value we're going to be looking at, the translate y of the sphere. The second term we're going to say is 0 because this plane is at a 0 y value. It's right, it, this plane is situated on the grid, so the plane itself is situated at a, a translate y value of 0. We're going to say is the first term, the sphere's translate y value, is it greater than 0? If that's true, then we're going to use the true color. If it's not true, the translate y value is below 0 because it's be a negative y axis down here. That would be false. So then we would use the color that is false. Okay, so set that up. First of all, let's move my sphere up here and look at the condition. So first of all, the out color of this condition needs to go to the color of the Lambert. So we're connecting the out color to the color of the Lambert, like so. So we don't have any color yet, though. So let's make two textures. Let's go to our 2D textures, and we'll just use some of the ones that Maya comes with. For example, let's use a mountain texture here, out color into the color if, let's say color if false. So if the sphere goes below the plane, it's going to use this mountain texture. Otherwise, if it's above the plane, we should see, let's just say a ramp. So we have this ramp texture. We'll connect the out color of this to the color if true. Okay. So here we have a mountain texture and a ramp texture. The mountain's out color has been connected to the color if false value. So when, if, when the condition that is being asked for is returns a false answer, it will use the mountain texture. Then we have a ramp texture that has the out color applied to the color if true. So if the condition's question returns a true answer, it will use the ramp color. And just to make this a little more interesting, instead of using a black and white gradient, let's just change these colors a little bit to something uh, more interesting, more colorful trippy uh, psychedelic colors going on here. So in my scene here, let me press the 6 key, and you can see that right now we're seeing the ramp. And if I move this sphere down, we still see the ramp. And that's because we haven't really done anything. If we look at our condition, it says first term is 0, second term is 0, operation equal. Well, 0 is equal to 0, so it's showing us the true color, which is the ramp. But we can say, what if the first term was 1? Hit enter. Now you can see, first term is 1, second term is 0. These are not equal, so the color is false. So it's giving us this mountain texture. So just by changing these two numbers, you can affect this texture in this way. So it's not like you have to apply some other mechanic to these two terms. Just by having the terms be numbers that you type in, you can affect how this condition is uh, answered. But we're going to use something that's more driven by the sphere's movement. So we want the sphere's translate y value to be fed into the first term of the condition. So how do we do that? That's something else entirely. In the hypershade, typically, you will connect you know, textures to materials to utilities and so on. But now I want to connect a movement attribute of the sphere to this condition. How do we do that? Well, we can use what's called the connection editor. So here in the hypershade, if I go to window, connection editor right here. This brings us to the connection editor. So with this connection editor, we can actually connect almost anything to almost anything. Now we still have to follow the rules when it comes to a vector value to another vector value, a float value to another float value, those kinds of things. So data that are alike can be connected together in that way. So let me select the sphere and say reload left. So now my spheres, attributes, all these different things, there's a whole bunch of them here, have been loaded in on the left side. So now I'm going to select my condition node in my hypershade 
and say reload right. And here you can see everything that has to do with the condition node on the right. Now these two things you can see here, color if true and color if false are italics and kind of grayed out. These things have already had something else applied to them. And if you remember from our Hypershade overview video, which you can see if you click on the little eye in the upper right corner, you can only have one thing attached to these inputs at a time. So you can't say apply something else to the color if true, except it would, unless you want to take off what's currently there. Okay. So what we actually want to look at are first term and second term right here. But what do we want to connect? So you see here we're going from to. So we're looking at it from the sphere to the condition. So clicking over here on the right side actually doesn't do anything. I have to click on the left side first. And you'll notice as I click on different things, different items over here will gray out or become available just based on the type of data that I'm selecting. Okay. Hold down the control and you can deselect something. All right, so I want to find the translate Y value of my sphere. So let's look down through the list. There's a ton of stuff in here. Let's keep on going, keep on going. Here we go, translate right there. Now I want translate Y. If I expand translate with this little button on the left side, we can see we have translate X, translate Y, and translate Z. So it's the translate Y value that I want. Now you notice if I select just translate, all these different things gray out. That's because translate here, this is a vector. This is a X, Y, Z coordinate. It has three numbers involved, so it can't just be attached to anything. However, translate Y is a float value. It's a single number. It can be connected to lots of different things. So let's connect translate Y to the first term of our sphere. Okay? So now over here in the condition nodes uh, property editor, you can see the first term has been applied with a value. Let me open the channel box and select my sphere. You can see here the translate Y value is 3.048. I can close the connection editor now. So the, the sphere is 3.048 units up in the air. So if I look at my condition now, you can see my first term is 3.048. However, that's not the question we're asking ourselves. Right now it's set to equal. So it's asking is 3.048 equal to zero? No then return the mountain texture. That's why we see this. Let's change the question. Instead of it being equal to, let's say, is it greater than? Now, is the first term, the translate Y value of the sphere, greater than zero? Yes. So now we're getting the ramp. So now let's move the sphere down. Right as I break that origin of the scene, it clicks and changes to mountain because that condition has become false. If I move it back up, it's a ramp. Move it back down, it's the mountain. Up, ramp, down, mountain. Just by moving the sphere back and forth, we can get those changes to happen. That's just one example of how you could use this condition node. There are other ways you can use the condition node as well. Uh, there's more ways than I can even really show you, but I'm gonna try to show you one more way that's a bit more out of the box. So the condition node can be used for things other than materials. You can use them for almost anything, really. So here I have two cubes. So again, I'm gonna use positional data uh, with our condition node instead of materials. So what I wanna have happen is whenever this cube rotates to the left, this cube will also rotate to the left. However, when it rotates to the right, this cube will not. Okay, let's try and see if we can make that happen. So the rotation X of both these cubes is what we're gonna be dealing with. And when it comes to a vector value of X, Y, Z, that's the equivalent of R, G, B. So even though these things are saying color if true, color if false, it can still take vector information such as the X value. Just understand that the X value would go into this first number. This is the X slot or the R. So red R X axis is also red. That's just how you can kind of think of it. So these are RGB for colors, but also they can be considered X, Y, and Z for positional data. Okay. So again, I'm going to use my connection editor. So I have my cube selected. I go window connection editor here. Since I have the cube already selected, 
is already loaded on the left. Select my condition, reload right. So now I'm looking for a rotate X. So scroll down through here, looking for rotate. Expand this open and click on rotate X. So rotate X can be our first term. Okay. And also if color, so if it's greater than zero, it will equal the color if true. So we want to open up color if true and connect it to color if true R. So what we're doing is the rotate X value is our first term and the same value will be the X value for the color if true. X, Y, Z, don't forget. We don't have to connect Y or Z. We're only looking at the X right now, but we have to make sure we connect to the right one. We have to connect to the, the quote unquote R value just to keep it straight. Okay, so rotate X of this first cube. So the second cube, reload right, and then our condition should reload left. Now, right here it says color if false, and there's a one value here by default. We want to make sure we change that to zero, because if we don't, then the color if false will be a one, and you'll see the cube kind of, rot this cube rotate to a one unit in the X instead of zero. So we want to say the out color R, or X, is being plugged into the rotate X of the cube like this. So you see we get this kind of unit conversion thing. First term, the rotation of this cube. We'll rotate it. So you see I rotated a little bit over here. 41 point, let's just say I rotated 50 degrees. 50 and enter. And now this cube is also 50 degrees. If I rotate it back here and then past the zero point, so now it's negative, you notice this cube is at zero. So using this condition node, we can get something like this, where this cube rotates positive, the rotation is greater than zero, then this cube will also rotate the same. However, if we go back and it's negative, the cube, the second cube stops matching the rotation of the first. So that's using, again, a condition node. And I'm sure you guys can come up with lots of different ways of using this. It's also used quite extensively in, say, rigging, for example. But yeah, the condition node is pretty cool. I mean, there's, like I said, there's lots of different applications for this. The mind kind of uh, wonders, like, what else can I use this for? Because there's so many things you can uh, try to do with it. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and learning a little bit about the condition utility node in Maya. Thanks again for watching, and I'll talk to you later.